Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, by very popular request, we are doing another episode of Hackers React to Hacking Scenes. And the number one scenes that we've had requested over the last couple episodes has been Mr. Robot. So to do this, we have our very special guest, Nick, on the stream. Nick, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for having me on. I've done a couple of these in the past, but uh, I've never got to watch Mr. Robot on the live stream, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, so if you are not aware of who Nick is, uh, he is the former co-host of Nullbyte and the current co-host of Hack5. So kind of a big deal, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, recently being able to be on Hack5 has been a lot of fun. Yeah, actually, Nick's, epi Nick's episode on Hack5 is still one of our best performing episodes. So uh, yeah, very, very excited to have him do more because uh, the first one, ironically, just on like Google dorking, went super well. <laughs> Yeah, you never know what the algorithm's going to catch. Yeah, I, I think it just kind of relates to like the average person. Like it really, it was kind of surprising to me that they never had a really good episode on Google dorking. So you were the one to come along and do it. You were you were the the ultimate uber dork, one might say. <laughs> some, some. Yeah, some might say. Uh, so all right, so today we're going to go through and. If you guys have been hanging with us through this stream, you might note that we've had some problems doing this before. The first time we tried to do this, we got a copyright strike immediately and they actually took down our stream. So the way that we're doing it today is we're actually pre-recorded uh, and that way we can upload this in a way that minimizes the chances of us getting a copyright strike because that does unfortunately happen even when the clips are fair use and sourced from YouTube itself, which is kind of ironic and stupid, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? So we're gonna go through a couple clips today and talk about how feasible they are and just kind of give our off the cuff reactions. I have not gone through and seen which ones we are going to do. I was presented with the list of them and I have completely ignored it. So I'm going to be totally surprised by this, um, even though I have seen Mr. Robot, so I do understand the context behind some of the scenes. So um, without further ado, Nick, do you feel do you feel prepared for this? Yeah, I feel ready. I've seen a couple episodes of Mr. Robot, and I've seen like some of the more famous scenes. And as far as I know, like they really um, they really take their hacks seriously, or more seriously than most shows. And they show off some cool stuff. Yeah, so they had really really excellent consultants, and that's why like Mr. Robot is kind of um, referred to a lot uh, when it comes to getting normal people to understand how hacking works in practice, because they have really excellent people who are advising them and telling them how this stuff really works and letting them know when they're jumping the shark and being just like, you know, ridiculous. So you won't hear very much just like techno babble in Mr. Robot. Like most of it does have some meaning as a plot element, at least uh, if not some actual like Linux or, or something like that that they're actually talking about. So we'll go through and see how much of this is actually factual and how much of it might be extremely exaggerated. So the first scene we have, um, Elliot hacks the capture the flag tournament. And um, Nick, what would you describe a capture the flag tournament as for the average person? Um, well, like ironically enough, I think of it as like a reverse hackathon. Where in a hackathon, you have you know 24, 48 hours to you're given a prompt and you have to like code something and build something to present at the end of that 24 hours. Uh, capture the flag is more adversarial and normally involves um, normally it'd be like one team against another, and uh, it can be straight up just hacking the other team system before you, but it, Normally is instead of a hackathon where you're building something, you're trying to break into some system first. Yeah. Yeah, so often this will be, um, there's like an encrypted code you have to break, or there's a server that contains something that you need to get, or you need to figure out how something works in order to glitch it and make it do something it wasn't intended to do. That's, I really like the analogy though of a reverse hackathon where like instead of building something in a day, you have to break something in a day. Yeah. That's pretty funny uh, and I think pretty accurate. So let's go ahead and uh, watch. It's gonna take forever before this is over. I could just win it for them. Okay. All right, so I'm going to pause it for a second and just say I've been to a lot of hackerspaces and I've been to a lot of uh, conferences that have had uh, like capture the flag games. I have never seen this much <laughs> hype before. Um, sometimes the music's decent, but generally um, it's a lot sweatier. Maybe the light level is roughly similar, but um, yeah, already this looks a lot cooler than I've ever seen the the hackerspace that I attended <laughs> in Los Angeles. There's uh, like people screaming and stuff in the background. Yeah. 
It's like a yeah. sporting event. Yeah. Exactly. Like the, the the kind of people that attend a hackathon are like not the kind of people usually to be screaming really loudly <laughs> while someone is like hacking, unless they just won the game. But I guess let's see. Sick okay, vape. I gotta love that like aggressive vaping. Um, <laughs> wow, that's uh, okay. <laughs> you know you're hard when some girl's just leaning over you, just vaping as hard as she absolutely can while you're doing your capture the flag. Okay, all right, all right, all right. They let you see the load your game, restoring all the mines you found and all the cells you cleared. That's the weakness. The game trusts whatever data you give it to recreate the board. Poison the data. You can make it run whatever code you want. I'm sorry, what? Did you catch any of that, Nick? Uh, it's hard because he's mumbling and there's loud music, but it seems like he's trying to exploit the trust that the system gives its users. Yeah, um, yeah, Let, let's play it back again because I did not hear shit. I'm sorry, that was really loud. Let's, let's try it. Mind you found housing clear. No, sorry, 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 sorry. They let you save and load your game, restoring all the mines you found and all the cells you cleared. That's the weakness. The game trusts whatever data you give it to recreate the board. Poison the data. You can make it run whatever code you want. But we already... It sounded like they were talking about Minesweeper to me. <laughs> like Yeah. I think we're missing some context about like what the game is that they're trying to hack. Because he said like shells and mines and... Yeah. It's hard, yeah, to, so... it's hard to understand. Like, just running, it sounds like they're talking about Minesweeper. So, okay, so far what I've heard is it sounds like they're playing a very intense game of Minesweeper and they're trying to poison the Minesweeper <laughs> game. Got yeah. it, let's move on. Thought about that. These are server side keys to verify the game saves. And without it, you just get a checksum error, which is why you play the game until you find the mines first. Once you know the full board, you can derive the key. Okay, so you play Minesweeper, and then once you know where all the mines are, you can derive the key so that you can glitch the game and change the save games. Okay, so this is like, sorry, did Nick, do you have a perspective? I, I don't, it sounds like he's, like you're, once you know like the game state, you can like reverse engineer how the key is generated, but I've never heard of like a secure, like communication key being generated by the state of a game. Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, what, what seems to be happening is they have like a game that they're trying to break in some way to be able to get it to do something with the save games that's normally verified. So it sounds like they have some sort of secure process that they're trying to break here. And the point of this is to figure out what the key is to be able to abuse, uh, like a, a sec essentially a key that's used to verify sa like save game data is what they're saying. So I guess you're trying to you're trying to break Minesweeper and uh, <laughs> make it run arbitrary code. I guess. Already <laughs> spotted the code injection button in the save helmet function, right? Man, not bad. Dude, just let him on. Wait, man. Wait. Oh my god. This this skinny nerd is so mean. <laughs> <laughs> no loyalty for his friend who's been working on this for multiple years. He's like, bro, just get up and move over. This guy's literally told you like two sentences. Like he could be an idiot. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that either about code injection. Um like I know what code injection is, but I don't know what he said about implementing it here. Okay, let's try it again. You already yeah. spotted the code injection button in the save helmet function, right? You've already spotted the code injection bone in the something function, right? In the what function, though? <laughs> I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Okay, so they spotted some sort of code injection. So, Nick, what is a code injection vulnerability? Code injection is when um, you're providing the user some kind of input, and it can be for a completely... Um, uh, like a normal safe thing to use. So like enter the name, like enter your name and then you'll give it a name like Nick and then you send it away. Uh, if you don't properly vet that user input, sometimes you can just dump in some code and then the, com the computer server will just run that code. Right, That's exactly. That. Yeah, so one way that I run into this in the wild is I'll have like a router and I'll run router exploit on it and I'll take a look and I'll see after doing a scan that it is vulnerable and it's vulnerable to something like a blind command injection. So blind just means that I have the ability to uh, bypass authentication and run a command on the router 
Uh, and if I know all the commands that are available, that could be really bad. I can just basically unlock it for myself and then step right in. Um, but I cannot see the result of my code. It's a blind command injection, so it doesn't allow me to see anything that comes back. So often there will be these vulnerabilities where you don't get a full interactive shell or anything. You're not like in, as it were, but you are able to whisper something in the ear of the server or the router or whatever and cause it to do something else that will allow you to get in. So that's usually what a uh, command injection would be. Dude, just on. Wait, man. Need I remind you? I was a cyber patriot finalist. Yeah. Oh my gosh, cyber patriot. Um, do you know what that is? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, so uh, when I started doing research on what was available to teenagers uh, for like cybersecurity games and stuff, the Cyber Patriot thing was like the only thing that was available. And this is something that's like run in a lot of high schools. And I think it's, I don't remember exactly who runs it, but it's a national program that has like a lot of reach. And it's one of the only like national cybersecurity programs out there for teens. So like, it's kind of surprising to see that they, they got some of the like basics, but it's also widely known for being easy. Um, so, there, this guy's it, bragging about winning some. So like this is company. some yeah. So this is some like very like subtle shade that uh, the or the writers here are throwing, which I actually really <laughs> enjoy. Yeah. So basically, he's he's bragging about um, you know completing or like being a finalist for a cybersecurity combination for like teenagers. If we don't make the top three, we're not going to Vegas. He knows his shit better than you. Fuck it. I've been at this for four fucking hours. You gotta deuce it out anyway. Soil in for the faint hearted. Okay. So there's some scary people. They talked about Soylent. Um, so I just want to mention um, that they just did a pro like a product mention with Soylent, which is typically associated with people who are um, like to work more than they like to care about eating. So uh, yeah. Uh, we actually had a hackathon one year where we had Soylent as a sponsor, and they sent us a bunch of uh, chocolate-flavored Soylent, and all the participants thought it was chocolate milk. So they went ahead and drank, like, four of them, <laughs> which is the equivalent of, like, four Big Macs, and then, like, most of them got stomach aches and had to leave the competition. So, um, fun fact, it's not chocolate milk, uh, but it is really popular in the tech community, and uh, it's kind of funny that they mention it because we literally had them as a sponsor of one of ours, and uh, it... Funny, funny story. <laughs> okay. I see them. Stay calm. If it's dark army, it's me they want, not you. Okay, so some evil hackers have come in, but he doesn't care because he's staring down the computer so that it will submit to him. All right, proceeding. <laughs> you have me an attack? It's okay. Don't stop. It'll be fine. Okay, that was <gasps> it. All right, so... So he comes in, he insults some dudes and be like, you guys even <laughs> thought of this command injection? Like, oh, we never thought of that. And then the guy's disloyal little weasel of a friend is just like, well, move over, fatso. I was a cyber patriot. And so that, uh, that's the gist of the scene. I mean, uh, it's pretty clear that he's going to sit down and he's going to, like, you know, glare at the computer until it submits to him. Uh, it's also pretty funny. Well, it's also pretty funny that he's, like, multitasking. Um and able to like handle someone's panic attack while also like winning a CTF at the same time. But like, you know, good for you. I can definitely yeah. only do one of those at the same time. All right, so now we have another one <clears throat> that hits a little bit close to home. This one, just from the title, is Elliot Hacks His Hospital. So I think I've seen this clip before, and the reason this hits close to home is because I recently did a TikTok video, which was taken down for bullying, um, which, was anonymously talking about the terrible security of my dentist office. If I wanted to, I could fax any business as my dentist office because their Wi-Fi network is connected straight to their fax machine. Um, and, and like printers and other sorts of things that just allow you to um, you know, do stuff that they probably didn't intend for you to do. So this is a scene where it might look ridiculous, but if you start poking around the security of your doctor, your dentist, a, a hospital, um, you might be surprised by what you see. So let's go ahead and roll. Test voluntarily. That's the only way that I'll recommend your release. Hospitals. A heavily networked one like this are almost too easy to hack. Okay, so just to be clear, this started a little late. Uh, it's She's saying that she wants him to submit to drug tests in order to be, uh, like, out, outputted from the hospital. And, um, 
you know, that's not going to work for him because this hacker guy really likes his drugs. <laughs> this is William Highsmith. Okay. Human resources, data file, employee. I love the nuance. This is like clear. This is, you know, like Windows, an old version of Windows. Um, we can see date of birth, social security number. You know, they went all the way out here to make this look like just a dumb human resources uh, file <laughs> from using software from like the 90s. Yeah, which a lot of um, like public services are still still using. Like, I would not be surprised. Like, peek behind like the receptionist desk and see a computer that looks like this. Um, yeah. I'm looking at like all the details. Yeah, they, like it's like a reasonable date of birth and everything. Yeah, they, they, they saw all the details. Last modified 2007. Uh, entered 1998. This bro's been here since 1998. So okay, so there was an unknown business. Uh, that I also did a TikTok about that uh, got around, got like uh, over 200,000 views. Um, and they had somebody like this, uh, so just like an IT dude, do their setup and ended up making a huge slew of mistakes uh, involving the cameras being accessible from basically anybody using their guest network. So obviously nobody likes being spied on by random people. Um, if you're an employee like clocking in in the back or have some expectation of privacy, uh, but it was just because they relied on one dude who was stretched way too thin, covering like a bunch of different random franchises that did not set things up properly and caused all these problems. So usually it is just one guy that's stretched way too thin and doesn't have the right resources to be able to do a good job, or maybe it even is just a little bit lazy and get uh, done with the job before it's finished. Yeah, and it's uh, oh, on that, like it's just really easy, I think, for organizations and you know normal people to underestimate the importance of cybersecurity. Like, yeah. Hire like a bunch of dudes with guns to sit in the lobby, but they don't. If they don't know, understand how to hack a computer, they don't, don't understand the importance of protecting it at the same time. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, let's continue. Out of the IT here, he is the IT department. He's also an idiot. Not that I blame him, because the people that hire him are also idiots. The poor guy only gets a budget of about seven thousand bucks a year, and he's supposed to protect their network from people like me. He never stood a chance. This is fair, but I want to read his emails now because I'm a snoop. All right, let's see. Schedule change Friday. Where are the wires? the wires? Screen frozen again? How do I fix this? <laughs> Voice message. Data abuse field not pro like probably populating is the next word. A strategic meeting. Voice m massages. Massage. <laughs> I, hope okay. I hope that's like a on purpose typo. The pharmacy needs release of info department. Hmm, why is this? Uh, I love it. I love it. This is like if this guy was the entire IT department and basically had to uh, do absolutely everything, uh, then like getting a, a multiple question mark, uh, you know, email from the neonatal center is absolutely something you might be inundated with. And your primary focus is going to be responding to messages like this. It's not going to be you know, doing anything to do with security because you are just focused on keeping the place together and security is a complete afterthought. You just w basically want to make sure you're not completely wide open, but beyond that, there's not very many expectations. And you, we can see the the date is also uh, 2012, so we've dated it here. And he's supposed to protect their network from people like me. He never stood a chance. He uses useless virus scans, dated servers, and security software that runs on Windows 98. Ha! It's one of the reasons why I made this place my problem. Okay, so there's a little dig at Windows 98. What's wrong with Windows 98, <laughs> Nick? Um, nothing. That was a decent version of Windows, right? It was Windows Me that people hated. That was in between but, 98 and XP. Nick, it's 2021. You can't be running a friggin' hospital oh, okay. on yeah, Windows even 98. Even in 2012. Yeah, even yeah. in 2012. Um... I mean, yeah, definitely not in 2021. In, in 2012, that was still pretty bad. Yeah, well, but, okay, uh, yeah. Give it, all right, so it was it was a while ago, but still, like, uh, Windows 98 is not known for its uh, security. Um, and I would say also, I love medical records system used by remote login. All right, so we can see, like, what kinds of records are being stored here. Um, I really love how much attention to detail they put into, like, these sorts of scenes. Uh, that are showing like what they're talking about. So the mm -hmm. useless scanner, what is this? It doesn't even have a particular type. Um, 
but it's going through and it's just finding like you know malicious DLL files, removing them and whatever. This isn't this obviously isn't doing anything more than the bare minimum of what is you know kind of required in order to feel like you're ticking the box of running this fire scanner when it pops up and bothers you. All right, I'm gonna roll it. Security software that runs on Windows 98. It's one of the reasons why I made this place my primary care facility. I can make my health. Wow. <laughs> All right. Let's let's. Sorry to be a snoop again, but let's see. Uh, we're in. Um, oh wait. Now we're in 2015. Okay. So we've advanced. So uh, in 2015, we can see marijuana. Is that what is what drug is this? This is drug tests. Meta yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but see, is that how it's spelled? I mean, oh, I would. Yeah, I would, no. <laughs> I wouldn't know myself. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about that. But it just seems like there's a lot of R's in that marijuana. Um, but all right, we can see that he's being tested for marijuana. Negative, good for you. Amphetamines, negative, good for you. Uh, cocaine, good, negative. Opioids, wait a minute, buddy. Uh, cut off screen. Cut. Okay, well that's not good. You need to. You need to. Think about what you're doing. But hey, the rest of these are negative, so that's all good. No barbiturates, no benzodiazepines. Good for you. Well, it seems like, you know, you're overall doing okay. You just gotta, gotta get your average up there. <laughs> Records look like every other obedient zombie out there. Okay, well, you see, the way, the reason why he messed up is because the font's the wrong color. So he'd get caught. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, totally. He'd get caught there. Away. Exactly. You're looking through and you're like, why is this one bold? Why is this one like Helvetica? Like, yeah, yeah, definitely bold. It's definitely like a little bit wider, but not yeah. a bigger font. Yeah, nice try. So obviously this hack is foiled. You know, he didn't use the correct font and this is way too bold. I would spot this in a second. <laughs> okay. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to do morphine again. <clears throat> Well, did, okay, he just, for... did he just type that with his mind, by the way? I didn't see him using a computer during that whole scene. Yes. So, um, yeah, this is when they, the title's Mr. Robot, Nick, if you pay attention. <laughs> so clearly the mind machine interface is part of the subplot that we've missed oh, by skipping course. around through the clips. Of yeah. course. Um, all right. So what did we learn from this? Well, I would say we learned that um, hospitals and other sorts of medical facilities definitely do have bad cybersecurity. And if you were someone that was taking advantage of that, I was thinking today, I could, you know, send a fax as my dentist to another place with like a recommendation and everything. And then if they have a good relationship, like it's it's pretty likely that that other place isn't going to like call back and verify that everything they just got is actually legit unless it's super weird looking. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the way that like... Um, there was an attack against a bunch of banks a while ago where they abused the bank's secure messaging system and were just authorizing transfers of millions of dollars until they made a bunch of typos and they got caught. So like, it kind of seems like the same kind of attack would be possible with medical records if you want to just falsify medical records in order, in order to cover your tracks. Elliot okay. hacks phones. So we're going to learn about uh, hacking phones now. Yes, we are going to learn about hacking phones. So the context of this is that Gideon is is Elliot's boss. Oh, at the evil corporation. <laughs> no, at like a subsidiary that, or like at a, at uh, All so Safe all Cybersecurity. Safe. Okay. Who is a cla or a, a, a mm. they work for Evil Corp doing security. Okay, so this but is like badly. an insurance company. No, this is a cybersecurity company that. Oh, like, I see. This is like I a, thought it was like a riff like, on All State. Okay, I see. Oh, that. no, that's very funny. No, this is like uh, trying to be pretend to be like Rapid7 or something. Like somebody okay. who's like like doing cybersecurity for a bigger vendor. See ya, I see. Ya. Yeah. I just gotta get to that phone. 100 large MMS files to Gideon's phone drained it. Okay, so what does that mean, Nick? He so he sent in a lot of uh, picture messages. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know to who, and I don't know what those picture messages are. Um, and this was 2015, so I guess, I guess in America people still could have been using MMS. But bro, if you're sending that many pictures, like use a use an internet based based messaging system. Well, uh, I think like, the point is that it's going to cause it to like use all of its transmission power, and it's going to be basically. He, oh, did Mr. Robot like force him to do that? 
Like, yeah, so, was so, he, oh, I see. So, okay. so the setup for this is like he needs to get the phone away from the guy and distract gotcha. the guy while he's separated from his phone. So in order to ensure that the phone is charging, um, he's sending a bunch of high priority, large messages over and over and over and over. So the phone is basically like using its maximum transmission power to like download these like huge files over and over and over. So there are attacks that are just designed to drain batteries and there are some Wi-Fi based attacks that are designed to do something like this by jacking up the transmission power and decreasing the amount of time that a battery can last while transmitting at those power levels. So that's kind of what's happening here. I, I didn't catch that part. I thought um, he just, Gideon was just like a creep and sending weird pictures at work. Um, oh, no, yeah, he's that's, just like, that's, damn, that's my boss has sent a hundred huge text, <laughs> like, video messages. No, 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 this is, uh, he's, like, deliberately trying to drain his boss's phone by sending okay, a bunch of really... Okay, that's clever, then. I like that. I like yeah, that. It's, instead of just weird. <laughs> okay, that was iMessage, not Signal. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Corporate greed is a trickle-down desire that reaches even the bottom of the food chain. And for what? Well, what the power? shit? It's a I really <laughs> like that response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is it because the f bomb is like as a would that cost USA more to the, to the FCC? <laughs> it's like, all right, we can't do an f bomb, but we'll do an s bomb. Yeah. You know, you got to make some uh, some choices here. Um, so obviously what's happened is like people are trying to, this seems to be a distraction. Like instead of hacking everyone's screen at the same time and making a big dramatic show, they're only doing this in one specific area, which is causing everyone to gather. You, all safe, are a defender Holy of the shit. F society knows us. But your sweet dream is over and your nightmare is about to begin. We have warned that those who are complicit... What the hell's happening now? Uh, oh, okay. Those, for one, this boss seems very fed up. Um, I feel bad for him immediately already. Um, next up, uh, yeah, it seems like this is working pretty well so far. Just by creating like a spooky movie that gets everybody uh, all gathered together to see it and then putting it in a relatively isolated part of the office so that you have to be like right there in order to see it you create a spectacle that you have to really like isolate yourself from uh, your charging cell phone in order to see. Except the tyranny has no place in the new order. The distraction is momentary. Hopefully all they need. They will know our justice and we will show no mercy. Gideon Goddard, you are a lackey to your corporate overlords. Nice. They called him out by name to try to distract him even further. Although, like, another employee, like, wandering out and seeing what you're doing would be, like, a pretty dumb thing. Someone shut this. Defending those that bleed the innocent. Do, do, do. Serving them. Slave to master. It's ignoring the remote. They hacked our smart TV. Congratulations, man. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> My smart TV ignores the remote all the time on its own. So I'm going to say in terms of uh, veracity, like, yeah, sure. Like, you can do this because smart TVs kind of suck. All right. It's posted to our website. And YouTube. Oh, they're streaming it to their website? And That's YouTube. actually in their YouTube. That is... A, a whole measure above yeah. just streaming it to one. So now at yeah. this point, like not only are they watching it, but they know it's going out to everyone. So they're freaking out. Yeah. Cause before this, I was like, all right, just cast this video to the TV and put dead batteries in the remote. And there you go. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Streaming yeah, it on their website. Like, like literally they could have just like Elliot could have like snuck over and just like taken one battery out and closed it. And they're like, <laughs> they hacked the remote. And this is like, no, your guy just took the battery. Um, <laughs> Which is great because then it ratchets up the fear even further. Um, but yeah, that's real. Or they could, like, if it was like an infrared one, they could literally just tape over the infrared <laughs> receiver and they're just like, oh no. <laughs> the remote. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, for them to actually go through and start, like, like posting it to someone's website and their streaming server, it means that you probably, like, fish an employee or have inside access, as is the case here. So, I mean, for somebody who had legitimate access to these things to, you know, go through and, like, allow somebody else to abuse their credentials, like, 
insider attacks are really easy to pull off. So I would say that's pretty credible. Although it definitely has ratcheted up the amount of skill needed here because previously you just need like an app and maybe access to the same Wi-Fi network in order to pull off, you know, streaming to a smart TV without permission. I do that at restaurants. CNB yeah. In 90 seconds, this code will change. If I don't log in with it on my computer before then, I'll lose everything to time. We are exposing. Okay, so Nick, what is it? What's happening? What is he trying to get? Is he trying to get? I don't know. I didn't catch that actually. I was I was two thinking about I was thinking about how easy it is to hack. Two two, oh, two-factor authentication. Yep. I thought it was, I was thinking about how easy it is to um, play music on Sono speakers if restaurants don't use guest networks. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. So actually that's recently changed and I'm very, very sorry to say that. By default now, it requires you to sign in to the account that's associated with the Sonos. Oh, I am like a... <laughs> shocked and appalled by this change, but eventually like enough people got tired of like being in a coffee shop and being like, wow, that song was a little spicy. Like, wow, there's cursing in that song. I'm like, okay, well that song is disgusting. Like what is going on? And like, you know, you just like slowly start changing it up and seeing if anyone notices. It was fun while it lasted, but yeah, Sonos speakers now require you to sign in with, uh, yeah, your the account that's associated with it. And you have to go and actually reset it in order to change that. So big bummer, right, Nick? Doesn't that suck? That's so sad, that's so sad. Yeah. Okay, but back to Mr. Robot. He's trying right. to, um, he's just like getting like, I don't know, the push notification and then accepting it uh, no, already, I wouldn't I'm, say I wouldn't say that this was the push notification. I would say this is one better. This is the hardware. Uh, the phone is acting as a hardware security oh, key. Okay. So a cool. lot of people will use like an authenticator, like Google Authenticator or mm -hmm. like Authy or like some of the other ones that are out there that will allow you to use your hardware as like a cryptographic key. So you'll be able to do a challenge response to it. Uh, but if you look at the phone, it's constantly changing. So there's like a little mm -hmm. time window and each code is only valid for about 90 seconds. So this is a pretty complicated security mechanism. It means you need to get physical access to the phone in order to defeat it. And personally, like I secure most of my devices that, or most of my accounts this way, because you know if you get my password, it's not very useful to you unless you also get physical access to my phone, not my phone number, which is easier to do with things like SIM swapping. But if you need access to my physical phone, that's a whole different ball game and it makes it a lot more difficult to pull off an attack like this. So, you know, he's basically, the they've set this up to so that Gideon has like the hardest security. He has like 2FA because he's supposed to be a professional. He's not gonna be making stupid mistakes. So because, you know, you can tell from his tiny round glasses that like he's a smart guy, uh, you know, he's not gonna be, doing things that would be vulnerable to SIM swapping. He would be using either a hardware key, which would be easier or harder to get depending on how you see it. I would say a phone is like in some ways harder to get because they tend to be with people all the time. So they, they're they usually really excellent 2FA keys. Maybe not in this specific case. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like, I don't remember, I don't know if Elliot explained how he got on this phone, but there wasn't even a passcode to get on the phone. Maybe Maybe that went over my head too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting point. Sometimes when phones are charging, they will keep their screen. Well, they'll they'll stay unlocked indefinitely. <clears throat> so if you don't lock it, um, one thing I noticed is like I think that the guy was on his phone or 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 oh, near it yeah. when the thing happened. So I think he put it down without clicking it to lock it. So I think Elliot got there before it locked itself, but maybe after the screen went dark. Okay, and yeah, maybe it is like when he's on his like work or home Wi-Fi, he doesn't have a passcode which i think is dumb but some people some some is, a, is an option yeah 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 bring your role to the world no let it finish and the world is very angry <laughs> 60 seconds white rose was right we run from one deadline to the next sketchy Okay, so everybody is all in one room, and he is over here. Where's Elliot? Okay, and, and now at this point they just noticed that Elliot is not there. Uh, all right, well. Oh no. Okay, so he's logging into a support ticket website. So it looks like he's trying to gain administrator access to something that allows this guy to send out support tickets to other people that will just do it. What are you doing? I was 
working on the local backup. Why weren't you in there with us? I was worried about... It just doesn't add up. All these events keep happening around your appearance, your disappearance. Get in. Forget it. I don't want to hear it. Well... Every member in this company stood in there watching the single worst thing that's happened to Allsafe. And where are you? At your cubicle? Doing what? That is a really good question, to be honest. <laughs> um, like it, to like uh, also, if I had just been caught doing that, I would I would be like, I'm trying to find out how they got in, or like yeah. you know, I'm like I'm trying to fix this. Not like oh, I was where our backup had a issue. The the database parsed itself wrong. Like well, what, what what are you talking about? Just like come up with the story and stick with it. Like you were we were under attack, so I figured I would find out what happened to the TV. Like just that seems fine. Like don't just mumble that like the database production issues. Like what? Well, what Elliot has in cybersecurity skills, it seems he is lacking in social engineering skills. This is in this case, I believe true. Um, and um, <laughs> Tiny Glasses Man's deduction skills are excellent. You know, like it seems like Elliot was. Um, not anywhere near when this happened, which is a little unusual because everybody else was gathered watching it happen. So let's see how this goes. Gideon, I hate to no, not now, Ollie. Evil corpse on the phone. Yes. Okay, so like a big corporate client, the only possible thing that could distract this man from his heated eye contact. Man, he looks furious in those little glasses. <laughs> I'll be back. We're not finished here. Okay, well, it seems... All right, so we had 60 seconds. That intense conversation lasted about 45 seconds. Are you in, bro? Did you get in? Yeah, I you're know. in. He said I didn't put the code in time. But yeah, I... I thought you didn't put the code in time because I didn't see you friggin' do it. But I had to hide it quickly before Gideon saw it. Okay, but when you minimized it, you were not on that screen. Let's, like, are you lying to me, bro? I thought we were in this together. All right, all right. Authentication request. Yeah, yeah, you're typing. Yeah. Okay, user and password, standard. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, no. He didn't do it. You lied to me, Mr. Robot. <laughs> Look at this. It's not even here. What are you Ooh. doing? I just watched the whole thing. I paused on it. It was not there. This show just actually lied to us. <laughs> I know. You thought I didn't do it. Well, yes, we've been watching your every action, and we did not see you do that. What the hell just happened? So did I just get? Did I just get two FIT? No. Well, did I just get gaslighted by this show? Like, I think so. Okay, so they they like they're just like, wow, you're surprised. Well, that's because we gave you false information. Like, why? All right. Well, let's. <laughs> I was working on the local backup. Why weren't you in there with us? Okay, sorry. Let's skip. Let's skip. I put the code in time. Yeah, but no. I had to hide it quickly before Gideon saw it. You hide it. You hid it so well it was invisible. <laughs> well, you're not sorry because you didn't even apologize for the right thing. All right. So the support ticket is to um, go into someone uh, named. G Can I just say that this looks like it was added in post? Which part? Um, Gideon Goddard. Like, like the name is out of focus, and then, then Gideon Goddard is like in a different font, and it's in focus. And it, it's slightly misaligned. It's yeah. Slightly lower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm pr just looking at it. I'm pretty sure that was added in post. But okay. So please remove Honeypot and restore normal connectivity on server. Blah blah blah. So there was a Honeypot added, and now it's going to be removed. And the Honeypot was designed to let somebody know if another person logged in. So Nick, what is a Honeypot for anybody who that doesn't know what one is? Um, a honeypot is, it can be something on a server where, um, mm -hmm. it makes a server seem especially vulnerable. Um, so, but if someone tries to, you know, exploit that honeypot, um, it's just logging all their information. So, you know, it could be something as simple as like a server that has like, um, a fake like front end that has a ridiculously easy password like root. And if anyone who tries to log into that, it logs their IP address or any other information about them. So, um, uh, these... The person, the server owner, can know who's trying to get into their business. Yes, so it's designed to make a server look um, vulnerable and exploitable. 
So if anybody is looking around for a really easy target, then hopefully that's the first thing that they go after. And in this case, it's something that is a big alarm that would have gone off and let everybody know that Elliot <clears throat> was up to something when he logged into the server later. For why, I completely forget. But at this point, he sent a... So this is actually, when we, we take a step back, this is a social engineering attack. There are a technical aspects to it, but the overall attack here is he's logging in as his boss and sending an email as his boss telling somebody else to do something. That is literally it. Yeah, yeah, there's no computer stuff in this part right here. It was about getting into this. The only like, like hard cyber security skills was really, however he got his boss's password <laughs> for the login, but even the... Um, you know, like creating a diversion and stuff. That was a lot of social engineering elements, even though I roasted it as social engineering skills. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, overall, like a pretty good and successful attack, but it really seems like he got caught. Like it was, this was, the attack was <laughs> successful, but like the guy who was attacked knows ex is incredibly suspicious of him. So did he get away with it? No, I don't think he did. He got caught. I mean, he he did it. So I, I guess he sort of got away with it, but he didn't get away without being caught. So he's probably yeah. also going to want to uncheck email reply. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't want any replies to go to his boss. Yeah, this is true. <gasps> Have I told you what I saw when I hacked Gideon? When I peeked into his secrets? I saw a good, honest man. Yeah, which makes you kind of a dick. Gideon is wrong. I am finished here. I'm no good for him or this place. He was only protecting his people. But me? Based on our SLA, please allow 48 hours for completion. Okay, okay. I'm doing this to protect everyone. All right, so he took advantage of his nice boss to log in and post a support ticket to a third party that they work with. Um, overall, a social engineering attack, which relied on draining the phone's battery by sending a bunch of large messages, creating a distraction by hacking a smart TV, and then ratcheting it up to a public affairs problem by broadcasting the same message over their website and YouTube, and then ultimately using that distraction to grab a 2FA key, log into his boss's customer service portal for some data center, and tell them to do one thing. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good hack. Um, but, I mean, I hope he actually is done at that company because once his uh, boss gets a reply from a ticket he didn't create, I think he'll know who made the ticket. Yes. Yes, it... Yeah. yeah. So this is like... There's two things. One, like there's a lot of potential to get caught here. Like when he checked the uh, the send <laughs> send reply to email, like that's one way that his boss could figure out that something was wrong there if he made that mistake. Or, uh, you know, if the support ticket then replies to him and was like, all right, got it, boss. He's like, got it, what? What are you talking about? And then he looks at the reply, he's like, oh, wait, I didn't say that. So um, seeing as he's already suspicious of Elliot, it just seems like he's been caught and... There's a ticking time bomb here for when the guy who's been hacked is going to figure out that something's up. Yeah, it seems, I don't know. It seems if he was like wanting to maintain his like uh, his status inside of the company, which can be beneficial if you're trying to bring it down, it seems like it might have been more efficient to just go after that server directly instead of doing all the social engineering steps, and putting your status of the company at risk. Yeah, it, well, yes, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Um, but I mean, for, for an account that requires like a, a device that's authenticated that way, like, you know, if this really is the only way in, then it was a, a pretty impressive way of getting yeah. around pretty much the best security that I recommend to people, which is make sure that you have a, cause I mean, he's on the local IP address. Uh, so all he really needs is that code in order to get in. Well, plus the password, I guess, but, uh, that could be achieved through phishing or something else. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up we have a, a scene that's about decryption. So I really like encryption. I really like ciphers. So let's go ahead and see how this one goes. This is a cipher message. That's yes, why I is. wanted to come home. Someone's trying <laughs> to make contact with me. Each number represents a letter. A is one, B is two, C is three. Okay, well that is not a cipher. That's just a replacement. <laughs> but okay, so technically, like that's not encryption. That's a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Did you did you ever make one of those like in uh, 
like grade school nick where like you just have an alphabet and then you either scramble it or assign like other random characters to it and think you're like super cool well yeah it's just like a caesar cipher but random instead of like a, a fixed offset yeah, so, so there's multiple different types of, of ciphers and encryption and whatever. And one of the, the absolute most basic is called a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. So you substitute one alphabet for another uh, alphabet, but it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So a, like A is, you know, one every time. B is two every time. Um, or, or, you know, some other substituted character. Um, there's other types of monoalphabetic substitution ciphers, like the Caesar cipher, like you mentioned, or mm -hmm. uh, there's ones where it's called a shift cipher, where you just literally move it down. So instead of uh, A equals one, um, a, a equals two. So it's shifted down by one. That's a type of monoalphabetic substitution cipher. But then there are more interesting types called polyalphabetic substitution ciphers. So let's say that there was some other code. Let's say it's like, one, five, two, three. And each time that you are going to put a letter down, you're going to shift the alphabet um, down by three, uh, down by two, or, or something like that, with some other code kind of dictating how you're shifting the alphabet around. Because the alphabet changes every letter, and A is not always one, um, you know, maybe it's uh, sometimes two or four or whatever because the alphabet's kind of sliding around and changing. It creates an extra layer of randomness and an extra layer of uh, protection. So if this is really literally just a monoalphabetic substitution cipher, it means that somebody's just taking letters and just turn them into numbers. That's not a yeah. cipher. Or that's, those are, that, I mean, that's not encryption. That's just a it's code. It's so easy to crack with a computer because you just run it through a letter frequency counter and then you're able to, I mean, if it's randomly scrambled, you just have, you just have to keep trying to roughly map the freak, like the most frequently used symbols to the most frequently used letters. And then eventually you'll be able to figure it out pretty fast. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Already seems a little silly, but let's, let's go. You can hear him too, right? Yeah. We can hear your dad. <laughs> I like his hat. G okay. Kali Linux. You. R. Grr. Yes. Gibberish. G U R T H E. A shift value of 13. Ha! Ha! Shifting ciphers. What did I tell you? So instead of a dumb monoalphabetic substitution cipher, this is starting to look a much like a much more interesting polyalphabetic substitution cipher, meaning this alphabet isn't the same for every letter. It's shifting around while the message is being displayed. So there's basically two codes here. There's a, an overlying code that is causing this to shift either a constant amount or a variable amount. So if this is a, like, have you ever heard of a rot cipher? I have not. Okay, so a rot cipher is a rotated cipher. So you have you start with you know everything is um, one, a equals one, b equals two, whatever, um, and then you uh, rotate that by a certain number of uh, a cert by a certain number. So a rot thirteen would be uh, you rotate it by thirteen uh, places and then you stop. So it, it kind of goes around the end too. So once you get to the end of the alphabet, you come back to the beginning. So. Yes. Um, it's a very, very simple cipher because you can literally yes. rotate it on a disk uh, in order to do this. In fact, I think the cipher I have tattooed on my arms um, when put together properly allows you to do a rotation as one of the different ways you can uh, encode data. So again, not, not, this is a barely, barely encryption, but for uh, CTFs and stuff, a rot cipher is really, really common. Um, so now we're getting somewhere. So this isn't just a baby, you know, one-to-one -one correlation here. It's a rot 13 algorithm. Damn it. Okay, well, I just said that. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's a rot 13 algorithm. And an algorithm is a pretty good way to describe this. Hey, Nick, you've been to computer science. What would you describe an algorithm as? Uh, a ca algorithm is a sequence of steps that you can reliably follow and get a result you want. Jamal Ashraf at Pasadena City College <laughs> would be barely satisfied by that. But all right, <laughs> th that's that's great. Um, okay, so, um, so yes, this is... Again, um, I would not call this encryption. I would call this a code. Um, but yes, you could use an algorithm to just take a message and then very easily like rotate uh, uh, the number of the alphabet a certain amount and then have a cipher that to the average layperson would just be a bunch of gibberish. Um, you can also see, hey, what operating system are they using? 
Kali Linux. That's right. That's right. So did you know that Michael uh, prefers Parrot Security OS to Kali Linux? <gasps> I mean, I know. a lot of people do. Yeah, a lot of, exactly. A lot of people do. Decode.org. Okay. Wait, wait. So he just pasted it. Okay, yeah. So now it's this is in English. So what has happened here? Um, this person has used, uh, I would say, like a level two out of ten um, cipher in order to communicate in secret. So the average person just picking this up would probably not be able to figure it out. But because we know the ROT13 cipher is really, really popular, we know that this has been rotated by 13 characters. So could we do this on a pen and paper? Absolutely. Um, it's really funny that like they're like, the scene is running long. So uh, they're just like, just paste it. Uh, but yes, there are tools out there. In fact, like Nick, like you could write a tool in Python that would be like two lines that would take oh, yeah. like a message and be able to you know figure out its numeric value, shift it, and then put it back into a letter. So um, it's kind of funny that they didn't just like use a, a line of code to do this. They just use like a website <laughs> and they copied and pasted it's it like true. Google Translate because this isn't you know I was able to explain this to you guys in like. 60 seconds. So this isn't exactly rocket science when it comes to like the cipher on my wrist is like so much more complicated than that um, <laughs> that it takes me an extra like two minutes maybe to explain. But this one is like a very simple code or algorithm one might say to take some data and shift it just enough that it's not that cipher you came up with in eighth grade and thought you were like a literal genius. The parent pages will help you find your calling but don't be duped cut down the woods they be erdos um don't be duped that's all i got out of that i just want to say that i really enjoy whoever wrote that line because duped <laughs> is an excellent word let's continue Okay, um, so this is a reference to, at this point, it just seems like a scavenger hunt for rich people, um, but like whatever. So we have like a, a very loosely coded message with a reference to um, a mathematical formula. No. Now we have a certain sequence. What is this, Nick? I have no idea. I recognize this website, though. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, online sequ uh, encyclopedia of sequences. Number six. Okay, now we have Erdos Woods number. So they're basically talking about a um, common uh, common length of interval of consecutive integers. Um, so it's just like a bunch of random looking numbers. Where, where, where are you? Okay, so there's now a bunch of random numbers that are written on the menu. Okay, so the, it's digging deeper. Cut down the woods. Remote. So get rid of, okay, cut down the woods. So we're getting rid of woods numbers. Of all of the Perrin and Erdos woods numbers. Okay, so like next up it proposed, so first we have like a, like honestly kind of dumbass like, like code that's protecting the first message. And then we have a cryptic riddle, which tells you to go Google two mathematic, mathematical formulas and erase one, or like erase one from the other. So like get rid of all the ones from here and then keep the, the rest of the numbers from this sequence. So you're basically eliminating a bunch of randomly scribbled numbers on it until you're getting the real message. That's what it is. that what you're getting, Nick? Yeah. OK. OK. So one thing that's cool here is like the uh, the numbers that are scribbled are, cor are like correlating to a men like a menu item number. So maybe like just randomly correlating them. They've created a game of chance where you have to solve this stupid puzzle that anybody who can look at Wikipedia or whatever that encyclopedia you just mentioned <laughs> is could do. But all right, let's let's do it. What is this, an IP address? A MAC address? What is it? Oh, it's hex. It's hexadecimal. It's hexadecimal. What is that, Nick? Hexadecimal? Yeah. What is hex? Uh, it's just base 16. So like we count in base 10, binary is base 2, hexadecimal is just base 16. 
Gross, right? It's a phone number. Whoa. But to who? Google it. You just call it? <laughs> 25th and 8th. There will be a cab waiting. Do you think that was a person or a robot like who answered it? Like automatic? Um, if I was setting this up, I wouldn't pay a dude to just sit there and like, like <laughs> have have the robo voice on call. I would like have a system that like deletes itself as soon as it's called once. Mm-hmm. Wow, okay, so there was there was like a lot going on here. So all right, so um ultimately the hidden piece of information was a phone number. But in order to get to that, well, in order to get to that, you had to eliminate a bunch of um like a bunch of extraneous information, like which was basically assault. Nick, what's assault? I don't particularly know. I just know it's something you add to some encryption algorithms to make it more encrypted. I don't know how it actually works, though. Right. So there's a lot of different ways of uh, adding a salt to something. In this case, I'm using the word salt very loosely because essentially we're adding extraneous data here that would confuse someone trying to decrypt this or to uh, decode this, I guess would be the most mm -hmm. accurate way of saying it. But yeah, so here like we have a, a piece of information that's hidden by false data and the riddle in the back, which is very, very loosely encoded, is designed to help you eliminate all the different pieces of data that are not related to the final result. So the final result was just encoded in hex, which when put into a simple hex converter allowed them to see that, hey, it's a phone number. So um, I would have gone the extra step of like looking up the phone number to see if it's registered to anyone, but they just went ahead and called it. So bold, <laughs> very, very bold. How are we doing on time? We're, yeah, okay. So I think we've got another one going on. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next scene. But altogether, I would say this was um, pretty impressive because uh, while I was making a lot of fun of the initial code that was being used, the, the fact that they had like a couple layers of obfuscation is exactly the sort of thing that you would see. Uh, whoa. Whoa. Uh, exactly the sort of thing you would see at like a, mm -hmm. like a CT, uh, capture the flag or something like that. Okay. Right. It looks like you did an APT get update. Yes, yeah, somebody's updating. Good for them. All right, <laughs> let's, let's roll. Okay, I'm sorry, what the hell is happening? Whoa, uh, whoa, that's a very aggressive last line. Bitch uh, picks. Yeah, so it looks like somebody's joined IRC. Um, I don't know what this client is, though. Um, is it IRC? I don't know. Everything in order. Oh, uh, someone's senpai, that's great. That's very accurate. Oh, I ha I've had that lamp, I hated it. Step one, identify the target and its flaws. There yeah. are always flaws. Yes. I learned that early in life. My first hack, the local library, a vulnerable FTP server and its AS400. A far cry from the Android zero days I'm using to own the FBI standard issue smartphone. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. First, he hacked his high school, or his, his library. sorry, library, and uh, it had a vulnerable FTP server. Um, great. Second, um, the FTP has a standard Android phone that they give all their agents. I did not know that. Um, okay, so third, in order to have a zero, like, Nick, what is a zero-day vulnerability? Uh, a zero-day vulnerability is uh, some type of vulnerability that someone finds and isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it, when it's not disclosed um, responsibly and instead the hacking community just learns about it before the company can. Right, so zero days refers to, like, the amount of time uh, that the company has had to patch the uh, the problem. So uh, when a zero day is dropped or when someone's using a zero day, it means that um, it has not been widely released at all. So basically the company is either not aware of it or does not have a fix uh, in place. So uh, a zero day is a very difficult thing to come by. It's something that is is basically means you need to be smarter than the people that made the, the device in some ways by knowing where to look for these sorts of problems. And if you find one, they're typically worth a lot of money. So this is one thing where I'm gonna just call out and say like, the average person does not rely on zero days in order to do hacking stuff, um, unless they worked for uh, like the, the NSA or something like that. They have plenty of zero days to work with. 
But uh, the problem is, what they're supposed to do is reach out to like Microsoft and be like, hey, we found this problem. You guys come up with a fix and we'll pay you to keep it quiet until someone finds out about it and then you roll this fix out real quick. Um, and that's the way things are supposed to work. But that's not always how things actually work. And instead, uh, certain organizations will hoard zero days and not tell other companies about them. So when they're released, as was the case with, uh, oh my gosh, Blue, what was, the, what was the vulnerability? I'm already blocking on it. Oh, Eternal Blue. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Eternal Blue. That's one um, so one, like, or is that, that's WannaCry. Yes, that was WannaCry. But WannaCry used the um, Eternal Blue exploit that's right. to that's right. actually do its thing. So the re the whole reason that was possible was because there was supposed to be something in place where like Microsoft was supposed to have something ready to go just in case. But like they like the NSA like accidentally like whoopsie like forgot to tell them about that one <laughs> um even though they had like an agreement to like make sure that that didn't happen so microsoft then all of a sudden had to like pour all of its resources into coming up and pushing out a fix super fast and they had no time to do so because they were caught completely by surprise so like zero days are a big deal it's like not everybody that's running around wielding the old, uh, zero days so just for people that like aren't aware this is definitely an exaggerated part of um <laughs> mr robot the library was a test to see if I could even get into the system. I've since set greater goals. For instance, step two, build malware and prepare an attack. He's using... Oh, wait. okay. I didn't see those underscores, and that, that would have been a syntax error. But he's good. He's good. <laughs> stay, stay on him, Nick. At my fingertips, the zero days... Wait, if this is Python, code. he needs a colon. That, that's definitely a syntax error. He's going to get a warning. If, it might Elliot. not be Python, but it looks like Python. Yeah, it does look pretty simple. Attack. At my fingertips, the zero day is wrapped in code like a oh, Christmas Oh, no, it's not Python. Becomes it's definitely not Python. The programmatic expression oh, no, of my this? will. Okay, well, he's, I think he's a little high right now, but like generally <laughs> what he's talking about is right. Like you, you take an, uh, a zero day exploit, or you, you take a zero day vulnerability, you turn it into an exploit, and then you weaponize it. So you basically build malware by first finding a flaw, finding what you can do with a flaw, and then building a chain that allows you to use that flaw to accomplish your overall goal. I live for this shit. Whoa. Step three, a reverse shell two-stage exploit. The ideal package, load the malware into a femtocell delivery system. Okay, femtocell delivery system. So you're gonna put the malware in some sort of ser like um, network provider that it's connected to. Got it, got it. So, okay, one thing here, I just have to point out the average cybersecurity person, whether you're working on a red team or whatever, unless you work for the NSA, is not writing their own malware. You are using like Metasploit or like Cobalt Strike or some shit yeah. like that. Like you're not like like sitting down and manually writing out malware for every engagement. That is absolutely ridiculous. Are you changing variables and stuff? Like sure, absolutely. But are you custom writing zero day malware for your like your day job? No, no, no. Uh -huh. Yeah, like you might be adding like maybe writing scripts to automate like some things that malware can do or yeah, like you're saying like changing some variables and maybe adding a small feature, but um Writing code is very hard and time consuming, and so is writing malware. Yes, it is, especially if it relies on you to have found a vulnerability that literally nobody else knows about. Personal cell tower that'll intercept all mobile data, similar to my first time when I found myself staring at late book fees, employee names, member addresses. Okay. Everything was revealed. The secret of the perfect hack make it infallible hidden within the kernel is a logic bomb malicious code designed to execute under circumstances i've programmed should the fb nick what is a logic bomb uh i don't know so a logic bomb is supposed to be something that only goes off um, under certain circumstances and is uh programmed malicious behavior so um, a logic bomb can be something that is set to a time um, or it can be set to a certain condition. So there have been examples where like somebody will get fired and they'll just be like, all right, well, let me clear out my desk. I'll need 30 minutes. And they'll just schedule something malicious to happen at some point, like years in the future. This is like a real thing. Like people would like, like quit their jobs or leave their jobs under bad circumstances and just like schedule something awful. So like, uh, yeah, like this This is something that actually happens. Yeah, I take an image of the femtocell. All memory will self-corrupt or explode. Step f 
Okay, well, <laughs> let's just back up a little bit here. So if somebody takes, tries to take an image, so this is called anti-forensic. So he's trying to make it so that if somebody starts to try to examine this, it'll corrupt the data and cause it to be unrecoverable. Couple problems. One, it really needs to like wipe, really wipe itself in order for it to actually be unrecoverable. The second is um, explode. I'm sorry, are we glossing over that? <laughs> um, he's wire, like he's programmed, programmed this femto cell to explode if you try to recover the data from it? How? Are we just gonna gloss over that? Sorry, I, I just need to go over and hear that one more time. Is Take an image of the self destruct cell. all memory will self corrupt or explode. Oh. Okay. Is that so a that, metaphor? Maybe a I metaphor. I don't I don't know. I hope <laughs> it is because like I don't know what kind of hacker this guy is, but I don't know a single person that can make a femto cell explode with their zero day. Well, but then again, you if know, if you knew how to do that, would you really tell people? I guess I guess you're right. There probably are people that can make femto cells explode. But like it's not the <laughs> average person who can. Step four. Write the script. Why do it myself? because that's how I learned and I know exactly what, when, and how it's going to run. Bro, you're being a little bit cocky about this. <laughs> like, I feel like a lot of your identity is derived from your ability to write your own scripts. Have you considered maybe taking a vacation and letting your career take a back seat a little bit and asserting other parts of your identity? It just seems like maybe like you're taking this like seriously to the point that like it might be neglecting other parts of your mental health, but what do I know? I didn't do anything harmful my first time, just looked around, but I felt so powerful. Eleven years old and in complete control of the Washington Township Public Library. Today is different. I hacked the world. Fine. Wow. Okay, so he's definitely a little high. But it's cool that he, you know, <laughs> hacked the library when he was 11, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not a, lot, not a lot of 11 year olds can do that. Kudos yeah. to him. Yeah, now he's hacking the world. No step. Launch the attack. Once I do, I'll own the Android phone of every FBI agent in that building. I'll own Evil Corpse Network, applications, everything. Domain admin. This, the thrill of pwning a system. Oh Whoa. my god. Calm, calm yourself down, sir. Um, all right, so what's going on here? He's saying, he's proposing that he's going to have a malicious femto cell that is going to allow devices or cause devices to download an exploit and then basically he will be in control of those devices. So he has taken an exploit that's that's uh, against Android devices. He's packaged it into a femto cell and if he's able to force these devices to connect to that femto cell, he's going to be able to force a download of that malware onto the phones. Now, we were talking earlier today about like NSO Group and how they had several products available for hacking phones. And one of them was a no-click option where basically they abused an MMS feature to be able to automatically open a web page that is uh, uh, malicious and causes the phone to be exploited. So if he was using a similar technique, which again, tends to be for like the military or like 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 military grade cyber weapons like this isn't usually something that like civilians are like sitting around like home brewing and like talking about the time like hacking the library and finding a zero day in android and then rigging an exploding femto cell or a completely <laughs> different ball game um so wow um but yeah so some of this i just literally don't know how he would do but i you know let's let's see how it works out this is the greatest rush god access the feeling never gets old. Okay. Whoa. <gasps> Ew. You need to talk to the old sister man. The old IT guy set this up. There's an encrypted database on the old server I'm going to need access to. You want to talk to RT? If that's his name. I'll talk to Ray. See what's what. I hate this lamp. What was, what was, who's that guy though? I guess I, I should. I don't, watch. I don't, I don't care. I'm so fixated on the lamp. I just hate it. I hate that style of lamp. I hate how it clashes with the rest of the room, uh, and I just like it looks. It looks like it belongs in like a big fancy money office, and it being in this like kind of like gross like little home office is disconcerting. I also hate that the um, the windows behind him look like he's in a pool. 
or next to a pool or in proximity yeah. to some sort of pool. The two yeah, things together that. are just very off-putting. I don't like it. Also, that man. What? Okay. Oh, is this like the... Yeah, I think, I think we're good. I think that was it. So, um, a lot to unpack there. Um, he is doing the attacks that, like, again, like, a nation state would do, and not necessarily, like, a private citizen of any, of any, uh, sort that I know of. Now, okay, or do people find zero days? Yes, all the time. Like, that, by definition, any vulnerability that has not been, you know, patched is a zero day. So, every vulnerability is a zero day at some point. Um, so it's not like they're some magical, mythical, whatever thing, but discovering, like, an exploitable, um, zero day vulnerability against all Android devices is, like, not something that you do every day. Um, especially like hoarding one and then loading it into a femto cell and then again, yeah, this, rigging this whole, it to explode. This whole deployment mechanism is like a lot of research on its own end. And like just combining the two, like it's so casual is, yeah, you're right, pretty questionable. Yeah, so that being said, like is this, if bleeding edge technology was all used in perfect harmony with, with each other, is this possible? Yes. So can you have a femto cell that forces other devices to connect to it like a stingray? Yep, because we got stingrays. Can't Once those devices connect back to you, can they be used to abuse the phone? Yeah, we got Cellbrite. That's the thing that already exists. So can that connection be used to download malware? Yeah, Cellbrite does that. That's like one of the product features. Okay, so we're, we're, we're basically at like contemporary technology now. I was like, all right, could, could a guy take a zero day vulnerability and use a system like Cellbrite to download it to a defected cell phone? Yeah, that could happen. Um, but that guy would need to be like a total friggin' nerd and and just, you know, never go outside as we, we saw here and just sit there trying to figure out a bug in Android for like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Or I guess hack somebody that it, whose job is to do that and then just steal all their exploits. There was a campaign a while ago where I think it was North Korea was going after security researchers to go after their exploits. So they were hoping to be able to find, like they're just like, dang, exploits are hard to find. Maybe these guys got some. So they just started going after security researchers and trying to hack them in order to find out if they, they had heard about any exploits and were in the process of doing a disclosure. Which like, that's actually a really smart tactic to go after those people. Yeah, um, but yeah, this is like not the work of one person. Uh, like a lot of this work, yeah, it's it's collaborative. Like any kind of like, I mean, hacking stuff, you're still you know destroying the systems and stuff. But you're making like he's making the malware, and that's often a collaborative process uh, that is on a very large scale. Uh, and there's like you know, and we you didn't even mention the whole like self destructing uh, femto cell things, which I'm sure the manufacturers of those pump cells would be very interested in knowing. Oh my gosh, yeah, to have like a third, like another zero day in the femto cell <laughs> that causes it to just friggin' explode? Ex yeah, yeah, he could he could just like make millions of dollars just by exposing that as well. Yeah, yeah, and then he could use those millions of dollars to just, I don't know, to do something. I don't know, yeah, so... Go on um, vacation. Yeah, so let's just say that of the attacks, like I would say the social engineering attack with the cell phone is actually probably one of the most practical because like it, it involves bypassing the most recommended way of securing your accounts. So the fact that like uh, he was able to get the cell phone drain, well, first drain the cell phone so it was separated from the guy, uh, then go in, get the code, and then enter it within 90 seconds. Like really, that's how good the security is. So it's kind of like cool to show how difficult it would be to hack somebody that's fully set up 2FA that uses a uh, device as their 2FA device. So I kind of like that one. Nick, what was your favorite? I like that one. Uh... <laughs> I liked the extreme vaping in the CTF one too. That was pretty badass. That was <laughs> like, you know, someone's a badass where they're vaping over you while you try to win a CTF. Yeah. So rude, actually. I would be so <laughs> mad. I would be like, get that. I can't see the screen. Um, all right. So I think that's going to do it for hackers react to hacking scenes. The Mr. Robot special. Obviously, Mr. Robot was a very long series. There's lots of hacking scenes. So if you guys like it, please let us know. We're trying this out again and I really, really enjoy it. So thank you so much, Nick, for joining us and uh, watching some of these scenes with us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I yeah. And if you... If you're Nick crazy and you want to go see more content with Nick in it, make sure to check out Hack 5 where you can see more episodes by him um, already published and then hopefully coming up soon. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. See you around. Bye.